it's not gonna so uh the whole idea mark is um i've been doing this podcast on practice management as you know that's kind of your dad's interest your interest my interest yeah and um what we hope to talk about we could talk about shockwave but really kind of your protocols how you use ultrasound how you use shockwave if you use any amnio kind of just you know almost like taking open looking to open up the hood of your practice and what's working really well because you know you're about sharing i'm about sharing and it'll yep. help some of the younger doctors listening okay absolutely great okay great. I'll, I'll do a little intro and uh, then i'll get going okay hello and welcome to podiatry practice mastery my name is don pelto i have dr mark letterman here and we are going to be uh, talking a little bit about uh, practice management and shockwave and things like that welcome mark hey thank you very much good to see you yeah good to see you too so you're just kind of down the road in, in Connecticut and uh, you do a lot of kind of sports medicine and uh, tell me a little right. bit how you kind of got into the sports medicine niche and how it's treated you as a practitioner. Yeah. So my wife uh, is a, a former ice skater. And so I uh, had hung out at the rink a lot, started to meet some of the other coaches and started to uh, see some of those uh, young boys and girls who are getting injured on the ice. And um, then I, just started to develop more of a passion for, for um, other, you know, the, the kids that do sports really want to get better. They, they uh, have, you know, they present with injuries. The parents are usually really um, pretty open to letting us evaluate them properly, treat them properly, get them back on the field, back on the ice. And uh, so, yeah, I, I took an interest in that. I started um, attending some of the American uh, Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine conferences, eventually became a fellow of that society and a great bunch of people. Yeah. And uh, we've done some combined meetings with them over the years. So it just sort of, you know, went from there. Awesome. And in, in terms of, you know, I always like that there's a, a rule called the 80, 20 rule, you know, right. you know, what are those 20% of things that you pretty much couldn't practice without now? Like what's, what's making the big bang in your practice. And we can talk about some simple diagnoses, probably Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis. Those are the two big mm -hmm. common ones. So tell me a little bit about what's working right now for you. Yeah. So you know, I think that I think heel pain is probably still the number one um, complaint that brings new patients to the office. Um, uh, but what we started to do really about a decade ago and much more over the past five years is start to take a look at how can we treat these conditions certainly effectively, right? We all want to get our patients better. But one of the nuances now in medicine that I think we have to pay attention to uh, are um, patients' deductibles, patients' insurance, time off. Patients are much more savvy. They come in with a, a, already a diagnosis, which often is accurate. They've already done their research. They've talked to their friends. And so I think how we used to treat things, uh, let's just really quick take plantar fasciitis as an example. So uh, we all know that orthotics, physical therapy, uh, medication by mouth, cortisone injections, changing your shoes, stretching, night splints, all those kinds of things are sort of a staple of how we treat it. But all that costs a lot of money and time. And you can treat somebody for four months. In fact, I think the um, uh, American Academy of Foot and Ankle Surgeons sort of says you have to treat somebody for three to four months conservatively before you would consider surgery. And so uh, in that process, we used to look at shockwave, which we've had in the office for more than a decade, uh, as that stopgap measure when everything failed, we would do shockwave before we do surgery. And what we found is, just like the literature, 85% of those patients were getting better with shockwave if they weren't improving from the other things we did. And as I got more into shockwave, as I went to more conferences, as I talked to a lot of the orthopedic surgeons, particularly from Germany and Switzerland, who really are at the forefront of the research, we realized we were thinking about it wrong. What we ought to do is understand shockwave better, treat these patients with shockwave first, then pick up the pieces of those that don't get better. Shockwave, even if it's not covered by insurance, which basically it's not, is much more affordable for the patient. It's in and out. They don't have to break their stride and whatever even activity they're doing. And most patients got better. So we still pay attention certainly to the foot type and shoes and sometimes an over-the-counter insert, but it really changed the way we practice. And I think that once you establish that and patients talk and you do a little uh, lectures in the community and a little advertising on it, uh, it really builds on itself. So, so I use diagnostic ultrasound uh, certainly for a lot of different, you know, uh, and, and I'll, I'll cover that in a second, but, but particularly for plantar fasciitis, uh, you know, you, you can't and wouldn't treat a bone fracture if you took an x-ray and saw no fracture. Correct. So if the plantar fascia is not abnormal, we know that other things cause heel pain. 
It's not the majority of what comes in, but if but we use ultrasound all the time, much sooner than I'll order an X-ray, uh, because if the plantar fascia is not abnormal, then I'm going to have to think about how to treat them other than shockwave. So heel pain does not equal shockwave to me unless the diagnosis of an increased thickness in the fascia is there, and we and we and then the patient can see it. And then when we show them the contralateral side, which is if it's not painful is normal, then it's easy to say, look, here's what's happening. Here's how shockwave works. Here's what we're going to do. And off we go. That, that, that's awesome, Mark. So just so I understand, I've been talking to a lot of different people about this. I'm a, I'm a new patient coming into your practice. Do you do shockwave the first visit or do you set up like a series of them in the future and just do the ultrasound the first visit and do all the other stuff that goes along with it. Yeah, that's that's a great point. So I will ultras, you know, a new patient, I've got to still work them up and I'll and I'll ultrasound them, which takes, takes time. time. Yeah. yeah, it takes time. And I'm going back and forth and I want to explain to them what's going on. So it's not unusual for me to spend a combined half hour with a new patient, even if I'm in and out. Uh, and at that point, we're going to reschedule. The only people that I don't do that with is if I have the time and in the first 10 minutes, they've already had all this other stuff done. They've been referred to me for that and they've had pain for a long time. If I do the ultrasound quick and everything works out, we may start shockwave that day. But for the most part, they come back. And I book a half an hour for my shockwaves. I do not have my assistant do it. I do it. I like the feedback. I want to know how I'm doing week to week with this patient. And, uh, and, and so I take the time to do it myself. We put the time aside. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, your spacing out protocol, I, what I do is if the pain's over three months, I'll do uh, like three to six. If it's less than three months, I might do three and I do them a week apart. And I use, some of them I do radial only, other I do radial and focused. What's your kind of protocol? Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So that's really almost pretty much spot on. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> and we've actually talked here about would our, would our results be better if we did one a week for eight weeks in a row? Like, are we shorting our patients? Because, you know, often it can take, can be a couple months before patients all of a sudden feel like, wow, I'm a lot better after three treatments. So uh, I'll do just like you on a, on a patient that's fairly new and hasn't had much done. We'll do one uh, a week for three weeks, sometimes four weeks. I'll get them back in a month. I'll see where we are. For me, if they're 70, 80% better, honestly, they're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. If they're 50% better, I might do a fourth or a fifth, depending where we are. If they're no better, we'll maybe back up and, and see. And as far as, um, <coughs> excuse me, as far as radial versus uh, focus or both. So as you know, focus is really good for bone edema. It's really good for insertional tendinopathy. So uh, if the pain, and especially it always matches the ultrasound. So where the patient points, if it's pinpoint, then the tissue is hypoechoic at that area. There's fluid, it's obvious. If the patient has like a range of pain, you always see it thicker, much further proximal on the heel. It, it always is. So if it's more distal, then usually radial is fine. If it's all around the heel and right at the insertion of the tubercle, sometimes after the first treatment, depending on how they're doing, I'll mix in a little focal with it too. Mm -hmm. And if they're really no better after a month and I feel like they should be, based on the ultrasound, then I'll order an MRI. And if there's bone edema, I'll definitely go to focus. Because I think that bone edema for me kind of feels like precursor to a stress reaction at least. And, and uh, focus shockwave for non-unions, for fractures and for edema is really effective. Perfect. So, when, when, in your, when in your protocol do you go switching towards, let's say an amnio product, PRP product or cortisone product? When does that go in for you? Yeah. So the great mystery with heel pain is that with all that we're talking about, which absolutely is true, sometimes a cortisone injection takes the pain away. <laughs> I, I, is, I did it for 10 years until I had shockwave. You know, it worked fine well, for some people, you know. We talked about the, the age of our kids. So, you know, I've done it for 20 years, 25 years before I started doing shockwave. So, and I've talked to others around the country, uh, Low while other people who have used shockwave, who will do a cortisone shot and shockwave at the same day. So that doesn't intuitively make sense to me, but I think we all have things that, you know, depending on the patient, maybe that gets somebody better. And I have used, I've used oral medrol pack um, for Good six shock. days, like, uh, yep, like a month afterwards, okay. especially if on ultrasound, I see edema. And you know what? Sometimes that takes the rest of the pain away and they're fine. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not afraid to mix in a cortisone shot. Okay. Uh, the, 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 Folks in, in Germany that we let, we've heard lecture and that we speak back and forth, 
they're completely anti-cortisone, anti-oral prednisone. Uh, that's okay. They have documentation on that. But again, over the years, I've never heard anybody doing that. Um, and we do see some benefit. I don't do any PRP uh, personally. Uh, and my experience with amnio, I don't have a lot of it uh, in, in terms of our own personal study. There is an orthopedic surgeon out of California that I've seen at, at different conferences. He's a, a sort of a sports medicine guy, treats all over the body, and he does a lot of amnio and EPAT combination yep. and feels that there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, but how many people we get better by percentage without amnio seems to be pretty much spot on to what we're reading. So I haven't really introduced it. Part of that too is a cost basis because it's expensive to buy it and that it really increases the cost the patient's gonna pay. So I really gotta see where that makes a difference. Yeah, now just to focus in a little bit about prednisone and anti-inflammatories, the way I'm kind of doing it is, you know, no Motrin two days before, two days after, and then really no prednisone or cortisone. So you're, you, you, would, you would consider, like I would do a cortisone six weeks after I finish or the, the six week follow-up, if it's still hurting, do you do it right after a shock wave or do you think- No, it, not right after. Okay. So, so yeah, so I'll certain, so first of all, I, because we do so much shock wave, I have a lot of patients who will come in with severe knee or hip pain and they're on a daily anti-inflammatory. I pull them off that to do my shock wave. Their foot is improving, but their knee is killing them. And so, so I put them back on the Mobic or whatever they're taking once a day because they have to, yeah. and their foot still gets better. So we're missing that study of a hundred patients, you know, in one category and a hundred in another to really have control. And does does coming off an anti-inflammatory really matter? Mm -hmm. If so, to what percentage does it matter? It's hard to gauge that. Yeah. Generally, like you, I'll pull them off, but if they're hurting. Another part, particularly, I'm going to put them back on. If their foot's healing, I tend not to. Yeah. Uh, and at four weeks, when they come back, if they're really still hurting and there's really no improvement, uh, I might do a cortisone shot at that point, wait a couple weeks, get them back, see how they're doing. Um, I probably would be more inclined to do shockwave a fourth time and wait on the cortisone shot. Um, but so it, it really depends what I see on the ultrasound, though. Yeah. So if, if they're uh, they point to one spot. So like that typical plantar medial spot, right? They point to one spot and on the ultrasound, that spot is clearly the most pathology. I may do a cortisone shot under ultrasound guidance to make sure I get it right in that right spot. And a lot of those patients do really well. Yeah. And I didn't end up doing any shock waves. So I think, again, you have to use your technology and uh, just trust what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think ultrasound and shockwave have really just revolutionized how, we, I don't know how we'd practice without it anymore. You know, it, it affects you that much. hundred percent. And even for things that are not shockwave oriented, how many times have you used your ultrasound machine to look at what is clearly a ganglion except, oh, it's solid. Yeah. Oh, or, it has or, or getting mid, midfoot, midfoot injections where I used to kind of poke around and now oh, yeah. it goes in, you know, the second MP, MC joint or something like that, where before I right. used to poke all around so oh yeah yeah and now you know because you know if you put it inside the capsule you don't have to be in the buried in between the joint especially when in the midfoot it's hard to get in there anyway so as long as you're just looking and you can just slide it under the capsule yeah. you're good yeah. and that's, so yeah that's perfect i think we've covered a, a lot when you use in your hands a, a cam boot or something else some other type of dme or night splint when does that when do you throw that in yeah so have you ever tried to sleep with a night splint I usually want to watch it as they're watching TV at the end of the day. I say so, you'll probably take it off. And I'm usually yeah. Smiling, yeah, you're probably gonna take it off. So wear it before you go to bed. The, the the you know, the best night splints to do the job are uncomfortable to sleep with. And as soon as you start peeling it back to ones that are super easy to put on and keep on, they probably don't keep you in the right position. Um I don't go to it too, too often if they're um uh if they're super tight and they can tolerate it, I'm happy to do a night splint. I rarely do a cam boot um for heel pain. Uh, because I just don't find it's that necessary. Yeah, um, we need it. Yeah, I, yeah, the way I, the easy way I think about cortisone is if the pain is eight to ten, like if they're limping, really, really limping, that's where I'll do a cortisone even earlier on. Because if right. I find I find shockwave on a really, really painful, like a limping person, you're just they just can't tolerate it. 
I agree with that. that. That's a great point. And actually, that's where I'll a lot of times use when patients come in and they're really, really sore, even if I'm seeing a lot of pathology and I really feel EPAT's where we're going to go, and I schedule EPAT, I'll put them on a medrol dose pack mm. for six days. That's good. And they come back very often. They've been pain-free for a day or two. It started to come back, but the inflammation's down. Then we start the shockwave. That's great. Mark. That's how I use that. Cool. Let, let's try, well, tell me anything, any other kind of great pearls that you find that really help uh, that you've learned over the last, you know, 25 years with heel pain, anything else that you want to share maybe with some of the younger doctors that I think we've covered the most of it. So I think we have, you know, I mean, when we do surgery, we still do occasionally either someone that didn't want shockwave or they've been through so much or what we're doing didn't work because there are some people it doesn't work on. Um, I love the, uh, you know, the endoscopic plantar fascial releases. That's the only way I've done it since mm -hmm. uh, Steve Barrett talked about it back in the early 90s. And um, I never touch the spur. If there's a spur, I ignore it. I don't think that has anything, any bearing on it. Mm -hmm. um, personally, for me, at least in my practice, I haven't involved um, the post tibial nerve. I don't really do a tarsal tunnel release and an open fasciotomy. I think the scopes work great for so many mm -hmm. that if there's an odd case out there that I got to back up and look further after the surgery is done, that we do. But that's so, you know, but we don't do very many EPFs anymore with shockwave. Yeah, and we're also getting uh, EMTT now, the magneto. Oh, you have the uh, magneto? I don't have that. Tell me about that. So, well, <laughs> so we don't have it yet either. We ordered it. And it's I don't know. It seems like yet. magic. That and laser seem like magic to me. So tell me, what are your thoughts know. about laser and that? So. so so, I don't have any experience with the laser. And we didn't we didn't incorporate that just because it's hard to incorporate everything. And I just, um, I don't mm -hmm. know much about the I laser. think it's magic. That's what I think. I, well, I'll tell you, though, the EMTT, um, uh, uh, um, Amal Saxena out in California. He had been injured. He was in Germany lecturing with the folks over there and his knee was treated because at the time it was not FDA approved here. And I remember him saying a couple of years ago, he said, wow, wait till we get this. It was unbelievable, the treatment. And I've, and I've looked into it a lot. So what we try to do beyond plantar fasciitis and even Achilles tendonitis, which by the way, as you know, EPAT is just a home run for Achilles tendonitis. Yeah, you know all the all the itises, right? Peroneal tendonitis, posterior right. tibial tendonitis. What else do you use it on that you find that works really well? So I use it on midfoot arthritis. Okay. And we've had remarkable results with that. So you can, and I use, I have um, the Atlas tip, which is that sort of white rubbery tip, which is yep. really easy. That's to the tolerate. one I use too. Yeah, it's lighter. Yep. Right. So you can use that um, to kind of sort of soften the field a little bit and get them used to what they're feeling. I think it numbs it out a bit. And then I just go to focus with the larger standoff pad because the bone's right there. And I'll just, as much as they can tolerate. So I always do focus at the at um, midfoot arthritis. Uh, I've used focus for osteochondral defects in the ankle um, in uh, really competitive skaters. Wow. We've done about four treatments, about three weeks apart and took somebody from they couldn't jump on it to pain-free. And, and, and the subsequent MRI, MRI about a year later did not show much change, but she'd been pain-free almost the whole time and still is today. So that, that whole regenerative increasing the circulation, you know, uh, really works. And what would you rather do? I tell this to my colleagues all the time. Would you rather do shockwave for a half an hour uh, on, a, on a young competitive skater like that four times over the span of whatever, three months, or would you rather scope the ankle and do an OATS procedure and really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, so uh, especially for somebody where you may end their career just with some scar tissue. Yeah. It is remarkable. And, I, and so EMTT is gonna be a backup for midfoot arthritis, for first MPJ arthritis, um, for Achilles um, insertional tendinopathy, um, yeah, there will be a game changer to not hear yet. Yeah, once it gets here, I know it will be all talked to. Um, how how about now? I haven't had much success with neuropathy or, or neuromas. Any 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 success in your hands? Yeah, great question. I've not had a lot of success with neuromas as well. My dad, who uh, does you know a good amount of shockwave in the office too, tells me that he's had some pretty good success with neuromas. Um, the the research on it is not there in terms of showing efficacy. And um, most of the guys around, even with plantar plate tears, same kind of thing. Um, we've had some mixed success, but in those cases, I like the neurolysis injections for neuromas. Just in my hand, that seems to work better than shockwave. And for the plantar plate tears, 
We just like to go in and repair the plantar plate. It just seems to be more definitive. Okay. But again, the patient's hesitant. No harm. Yeah. No harm at all. In Connecticut, you guys get neurolysis covered? Is that covered with insurance? We do. Um, and what I do is I'll mix uh, some cortisone in. My, my typical cocktail has been about 0.5 cc's of a 4% alcohol mix. And then I'll actually throw in just about a, 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 a um, tenth, so a twentieth, a, a little less than a tenth of a cc of mar, plain marcaine, just to give a little longer acting boost. And sometimes I'll put in a tenth of a cc of decadron. Okay. So you are, if you're putting in decadron, it's a cortisone shot. Uh, so for those insurances that right, <laughs> but that's true. That's no one says how much I don't put in for um, uh, uh, an additional steroid um, code. There's like a J code for if you yeah. give more than 0. 0.6 cc's of a So steroid. you're billing it as a cortisone injection. When I put cortisone in, it's a cortisone shot. Thank you. Perfect. Right. Yeah, I learned that from some other guys here too. I think that's totally appropriate. Yeah. And we've, we've kept a lot of people out of surgery with neurolysis injections for sure. I gotta write that one down. Thank you. What now let's talk about, wow, we've, we've, we've covered a, a whole bunch here. Uh, we have maybe five minutes left. Um, any other really good pearls like that one that maybe other young doctors would like to know that really helped you? Um, let's see. Ultrasound, shockwave. Spend time with your patients. So, you know, today, um, podiatrists like you and I that care about our patients and have been around for a bit, we know that our patients, I'm sure you hear this too, patients will say, man, I wish you were my primary doc. He doesn't spend time with me. Tell, yeah. Right? So spend time with your patients. Don't be afraid to fill every moment uh, as if you know you have to see, you can't book anybody else for another slot kind of thing. Spend time, get to know your patients, um, make some notes on some family events so that when you see them again, you can say, how is that graduation? It's not fake, it's real. Take an interest in people. You see a lot of people, so writing stuff down makes sense. And when patients say, I can't believe you remember, I tell them, I say, you know, I have a lot of patients. I wrote it down. I wanted to know. But it shows that you're interested. It shows you care because you do care. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. If, if anyone, if no one knows your dad, I, I still have a good memory of your dad. And uh, I was in, I was going to the practice management groups back in the day and I was young. I just finished. I don't even know if it's out of residency. And he actually called me. He said, Don, can I help you with, you know, what are you, what are you looking to learn? How are you doing? You want to come to these meetings? And I went because of him, but like no one, like, it, when you really care and he sincerely cares right about his patients and, and you got that from him and that's the most he made me feel like the most important young doctor in the world and uh, that's yeah, what that's i like so nice to hear I, I and i you know it's funny i just wrote a piece for our um our state association because i'm the exec here in connecticut and um basically the theme was when i think back to those of us whose dads were podiatrists to what they went through to what little they could do in the 60s or 70s to what we do now uh, it, it is a challenge finding new practitioners to be involved in your society. And it's so important. You know, you, it's great to do ankle work and have great hospital privileges and ride on the coattails of people like my dad and so many others. But if we don't get the young people engaged, sitting on the boards, volunteering for committees, going to Special Olympics to help out in your state, all the things that make you part of the community, we're going to lose that great feeling of podiatry and time. Yeah. And uh, we are we are important and separate from what other medicine, other medical teams do in, in a sense that the amount of time we can spend with a patient and what a difference we can make quickly for a patient is really big. Yeah. So I hope people don't lose that. So I, on that note, I want to promote our upcoming conference in Connecticut. It's October 8th and 9th. Okay. And we have a really eclectic, amazing conference. We're get, we have a pain management section, a section on opioid addiction, a section on anticoagulant therapy and importance pre and post-op. Um, we have a keynote speaker, Dr. Eastman, coming from Dallas, who is a medical advisor to Homeland Security, wow. uh, head of uh, trauma, uh, orthopedic trauma at two area Dallas hospitals and a former lieutenant in the Dallas Police Department. He's been interviewed all over by the major networks for years. He's our keynote speaker on trauma. We have uh, uh, not just trauma, medicine-wise, but trauma psychologically to police and to surgeons yeah. uh, around active shooting situations and so forth. We have a really interesting, we have a lecture on um, 
physician wellness and suicide, which sadly is a, a problem amongst wow. all specialties. So yeah, so it'll be an amazing conference. It's at Foxwoods okay. um, Casino in Ledyard, Connecticut, October 8th and the morning of the 9th. Uh, for those that want to attend. What's the, uh, what's the website to go to your, your mass, your Connecticut yep. society? So uh, www.cpma.org. Uh, so the, the Connecticut one, not the California one. Perfect. And if, if people want to learn more about your practice or get in contact, what's your website if they want to? So ours is uh, 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 West Hartford Podiatry, uh, dot net. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate, I appreciate hey. chatting. Great to see you. I appreciate it so much. Thanks for the time.